front of this public lecture uh, organized by the Simons Institute for the Theory of Computing. Uh, my name is Peter Bartlett. I'm the Associate Director uh, at the, the Institute. Um, the Simons Institute is a living venue for uh, a collaborative research in theoretical computer science. It brings together top researchers and uh, the next generation of outstanding young scholars to explore deep unsolved problems about the nature and limits of computation and about what a, a computational viewpoint can reveal in other areas. The Institute's been going since uh, 2012 and its core activities revolve around uh, two semester long research programs uh, on specific topics in the foundations of computing and in related fields. This semester we've been convening two online programs, one on satisfiability uh, and one on the theoretical foundations of computer systems. And the Institute has a long standing tradition of appointing a science communicator in residence uh, with the aims of supporting authors and journalists in the areas of computer science and mathematics and of helping them uh, connect with the experts that uh, are here participating in our, in our programs. Um, also, we aim to increase the visibility of theoretical computer science and, and uh, uh, to help educate our participants about communicating their work to a broader audience. And uh, this semester, we're delighted to have as our science communicator in residence, Siobhan Roberts. Siobhan is a Canadian author and science journalist. She writes for the New York Times, Quanta and the New Yorker. Uh, she's the author of a biography of John Conway, uh, John Conway and uh, she wrote uh, an obituary for the New York Times uh, when he passed away last year. She's written a biography of Donald uh, Coxeter and, and uh, she wrote and produced a documentary about him also. And she's won the American Mathematical Society and the Mathematical Association of America's JPBM Communications Award for expository and popular books uh, and the Mathematical Association of America's Euler Prize for expanding the public's view of mathematics. Uh, and she's currently writing a biography of the group theorist and logician Verena Hoover Dyson. So we're delighted to have Siobhan back as the science communicator in residence. She was here a year ago um, and her talk today is entitled Embracing the Uncertainties. Welcome Siobhan. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, it's delightful to be back at the Simons Institute, even if just remotely. Um, I know it's gonna be a really productive semester. I already have a number of story ideas on the go drawing from the various workshops and boot camps. Um, so to start, perhaps I'll give a bit more background about me, um, just for some context. As a science journalist, my beat, broadly speaking, um, has been mathematics, and I have written two biographies of mathematicians. Um, and I should note, however, that I don't have any formal training in math or science. I did degrees in history and journalism. Um, so I take a, a generalist approach and I range around quite a bit. I've also written a biography of a wind engineer and I've covered everything from neuroscience to paleontology to cosmology. And in recent years, my focus is more and more on computing. But my subject today is one that cuts across the scientific spectrum, and that is uncertainty. Scientific uncertainty is something that I've been exploring for a while now, but of course it gained an immediacy and urgency last March when much of my reporting shifted to focus on COVID-19 and epidemiology and the pandemic. During my talk, I'll reflect on that reporting, which is ongoing still to some extent. So writing as a freelance contributor for the New York Times last year, um, my articles about the pandemic were what's called service journalism. So trying to do a public service in sharing essential information and thereby increasing awareness. My first COVID related piece featured a Q and A with Drew Harris, a population health analyst in Philadelphia who was among the first people to share and unpack this flatten the curve infographic. My second piece was also a Q&A with the husband and wife team of Bill Hanaj and Helen Jenkins, both epidemiologists in Boston. And they'd composed a version of this cut the transmission diagram with their kids on the whiteboard in their kitchen. And more recently, I did yet another Q&A with Ian Mackay, a virologist in Brisbane, Australia, who created this Swiss cheese infographic emphasizing how multiple interventions are necessary to mitigate and contain the coronavirus. So social distancing, masks, vaccination, no one intervention suffices on its own. All are necessary and have a cumulative effect in containing COVID-19. So these pieces all aim to convey the relative certainties, some of the information we know to be true. The bottom line being human behavior has a big effect on the dynamics of the pandemic. 
But the broader picture, of course, quickly revealed itself to be one of profound uncertainty. I first wrote about that in April last year with my article titled Embracing the Uncertainties. Back then, confirmed global cases of illness from coronavirus were approaching 1.5 million and reported deaths were into the six figures. But there were big unknowns, such as what are the true rates of infection and mortality? This art accompanied the article. Uh, it's by the illustrator, Stephen Savage. And at first I wasn't quite sure about it because it didn't capture what I'd hoped was at least a somewhat comforting or reassuring message. Um, but now I do think it was spot on because here we are a year later still trying to outrun many of the same uncertainties and the toll is massive. Confirmed cases worldwide are almost at 115 million and uh, reported deaths exceed 2.5 million. And there are still uncertainties such as the emergence of the variants and whether they will achieve viral escape or whether vaccines and natural immunity will still be effective. As I said in the article, this type of uncertainty about facts, numbers and science is called epistemic uncertainty. It's caused by a lack of knowledge about the past and the present. Or as David Spiegelhalter, a statistician at the Winton Center for Risk and Evidence Communication at Cambridge put it, epistemic uncertainty is caused by our, ignor our ignorance. Science of course is full of epistemic uncertainty. Circling the unknowns, inching toward truth through argument and experiment is how scientific progress is made. But science is often expected or assumed to be a monolithic collection of all the right answers. As a result, scientists and the politicians, policymakers, and journalists who depend on them are reluctant to acknowledge the inherent uncertainties, worried that candor undermines credibility. We've seen this again and again throughout the pandemic, especially in the early stages. Spiegelhalter was the main source for my Embracing the Uncertainties article. Since in Googling around, I came upon this article. It was uh, timely on the effects of communicating uncertainty on public trust in facts and numbers. It was by a group of researchers at the Winton Center, together with collaborators in math and social psychology. And the question behind their study asked, what happens when scientists do acknowledge uncertainty? The paper was published in late March of last year, but it had been submitted for review in August of 2019. So the timing was just fortuitous. The study's motivation, as Spiegelhalter explained it, was rooted in, quote, the accusations of a post-truth society and claims that the public had had enough of experts. This prompted the researchers to investigate whether trust in experts was lowered by their openly admitting uncertainty about what they know. But to the contrary, the study's findings suggested that being transparent about uncertainty does not in fact harm the public's trust in the facts or in the source. To give you a brief snapshot of the methodology, using online surveys, the study measured reactions to uncertainty expressed in statements about various subjects, such as the number of tigers left in India, the increase in global average surface temperature between 1880 and 2010, and un unemployment figures in the United Kingdom. The survey was replicated in the wild, so to speak, with a field study on the BBC News website. The researchers tested two different ways of expressing uncertainty, quantitatively with a numerical range or percentage versus qualitatively using a word such as estimated or approximately. And the counterintuitive results showed the more precise numerical statements were more effective, both in conveying uncertainty and in maintaining trust. There was in fact a minor reduction in trust, but they deemed the effect so small as to be trivial. So the conclusion as described by one of the co-authors was that people can handle the truth about the level of certainty or uncertainty that exists regarding scientific facts and knowledge. Again, all this research and analysis had been conducted in 2018 and 2019, but starting in March of last year, the experiment was replicated in several countries in the context of the pandemic with statements about the severity of COVID-19, among other questions about trust and trustworthiness of government officials and scientists. And as, as the results confirmed the paper's findings, this is a graph showing the level of trust in scientists handling of the pandemic. And this is the level of trust in information from government lower, but not too, too bad. So as Alexandra Freeman, a co-author and the executive director of the Winton Center told me, 
quote, where there is uncertainty around COVID-19, scientists shouldn't feel concerned about communicating this to the public. In fact, it may be important to do so. This group of researchers has been exploring uncertainty in its many forms for a while now. Freeman told me that at a conference of uncertainty specialists about two years ago, she asked attendees to write definitions of uncertainty on post-it notes and stick them on the wall. Everyone was different, she said, but her favorite was anything and everything that can muck up a decision, insert your descriptor of choice. The March study focused on people's reactions to epistemic uncertainty, things we don't know about the past and present, but in theory could come to know through measurement. The team since then has started researching perceptions of aleatory uncertainty, unknowns about the future due to randomness, indeterminacy, chance, or luck. Most uncertainty is a mix of epistemic and aleatory. For instance, how many more people by the end of the pandemic will get COVID-19? Common wisdom from a psychological perspective is that people do not like uncertainty, especially about the future, and that it generates a negative response. This is called ambiguity aversion. But from a statistical perspective, the hypothesis is that people have a positive reaction and trust information more when the communicator is being open about the uncertainties. And this was borne out in the research. For a broader perspective, I consulted with Lorraine Dastin, an historian of science at the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science in Berlin. She's someone I had consulted with previously on my uncertainty investigations. She found the study's results heartening and she pointed out that the public in turn must be open to considering and adapting to new evidence. She said, we the public must expect scientific views on the nature of the virus and how best to combat it to change as more evidence comes in and we must be prepared to change our conduct accordingly. So that was the scientific core of my first reporting on uncertainty, but I continued down the rabbit hole a bit further in that article. I learned, for instance, that in the early days of the outbreak, when data was just emerging from China, we were in a state of what's called deep uncertainty, also known as radical uncertainty. That is a quagmire of unknown unknowns. There were no constraints. Sometimes it feels as if we're still stuck in fairly deep uncertainty, but even last spring, Spiegelhalter argued that the uncertainty had been significantly constrained. He defines statistical science as a machine to turn the variability that we see in the world, the unpredictability, the enormous am amount of scatter and randomness that we see around us into a tool that can quantify our uncertainty about facts and numbers and science. Similarly, mathematical modeling provides projections that at once show and evaluate the uncertainties. But models that we, as we've seen are imperfect and have limitations. Models are simplifications of the real world. As the saying goes, the map is not the territory. This is re reminiscent of a one paragraph story by the Argentine writer Jorge Luis Borges written in 1946 on exactitude in science or on rigor in science, depending on the translation. The story is about a map that grows as large as the territory it was meant to represent. Dastin had first put me onto the Borges parable. So I went back to her and asked about its relevance in the context of the ongoing conversation around the limits of modeling. She said to quote, the parable captures a failing of a particular kind of model that is increasingly common in the age of big data. Vast increases in computing power have made it possible to fit a past sequence of events to a high degree of accuracy. The problem with such retrofitted models is that they're bad at predicting. Like the map that duplicates the empire, they cannot be extrapolated to new territories. Nor do they help us navigate the territory we know because they are theoryless. No one feature of the past phenomena is picked out as more significant than any other. To continue the map analogy, a small creek is reproduced as faithfully as a mighty river, even though the latter is a far more consequential, consequential feature of the landscape. So in short, the upshot of the Borges story is that a map which grows as large as the empire it represents becomes essentially useless. And science without uncertainty is not only useless, but impossible. This is a point that came up in a conversation I had not too long ago with the astrophysicist Saskia Hecker, 
at the Heidelberg Institute for Theoretical Studies. I spent last term there as a journalist in residence. Hecker mentioned that when she started studying astrophysics, she was shocked to discover that sometimes there are very large uncertainties in measuring stars. The amount of uncertainty in results pertaining to the age of a star can be as much as 50%. But when she, she went on to note that in what became her area of specialty, that is astro seismology, studying the internal structure of stars, various tools sharpen the measurements and reduce the uncertainty. For instance, the age of a red giant star, her particular subject of interest, can be estimated within about 20 to 30%, or even 10% in very good cases. So that is indeed a considerable reduction in uncertainty. Another researcher at the Heidelberg Institute, Vincent Ouvelin, leads the research group on data mining and uncertainty quantification. This line of investigation doesn't try to reduce the uncertainty, but rather accepts it and aims to compute it in order to derive the impact on large data sets. Ouvelin explained that the most obvious way of understanding uncertainty is forward propagation. Given a starting point, what will happen and with what degree of uncertainty? There is also backward propagation. Given a result that shows uncertainty, what is the origin of the uncertainty? One application that he's been uh, investigating is in the medical field. For instance, given cardiac surgery and a complexity of variables, what is the corridor of the result or what is the corridor of the uncertainty? Since uncertainty computation is highly CPU intensive, Huvlin works on what he calls hardware aware computing. That is increasing the accuracy of an uncertainty prediction by increasing the compute power for models using at best the underlying hardware architecture of supercomputers. And then in the context of the pandemic, a third area of research at the Heidelberg Institute that caught my attention was the computational statistics group led by Tillman Gneiting. Gneiting's area of expertise is forecasting, for instance, environmental sciences and weather and economics and finance. Last fall, a postdoc in the computational statistics group, Johannes Bracker, gave a seminar about a relatively new project that he's coordinating called the German-Polish COVID-19 Forecast Hub. This is a screenshot of the online platform. The goal of the Forecast Hub is basically to map or quantify the uncertainty with short-term probabilistic predictions of COVID-19 cases and deaths. Here the deaths are shown. The focus is on one and two week forecasts. Uh, the outer range is three and four week forecasts, but they are much less reliable. And the researchers always like to emphasize the distinction between short-term forecasts, which attempt to predict what is going to be observed in the future versus longer term scenario forecasts, which make a what if hypothesis statement about the future. For instance, how would the case rates change if nursing home staff were tested twice a week instead of once a week? In this graph, each color represents a model by a different modeling team, and the width of the color band indicates the range of uncertainty. More specifically, the aim of the forecast hub is to improve uncertainty predictions. So again, not to reduce the uncertainty, since given the nature of the pandemic, reducing uncertainty is impossible. As Knighting explained to me, to quote, it's different with weather, he said, with weather, we use models to reduce uncertainty. It's easy to quantify because there is a clear cut baseline based on data from previous years. For example, we know it's going to snow every 20th day or every 30th day in winter on average in Heidelberg. So by using weather forecasts, we can substantially reduce uncertainty. But for COVID-19, there's no baseline at all. Instead, the goal is to make the best attempt at quantifying the uncertainty. The approach is as follows. The researchers collect various forecasts done by independent teams in academia, government, and industry, and put them together in what's called an ensemble forecast. The ensemble forecast combines and compares, analyzes, and averages all the different predictions. The various models give differing forecasts because they use different data sources and methodologies. And what the researchers have found is that the ensemble model tends to do a better job predicting the uncertainty. It is a better, it is better than any average. Um, it is, is better than any individual forecast on average. As Bracker put it, one of the major advantages of the ensemble is that it is more stable. Individual models tend to get thrown off now and then when something doesn't go right. 
The ensemble model in averaging all the results provides more stability. It is rarely the best model, but it is often among the better models and in the long run shows good average performance. The German-Polish Forecast Hub runs in close collaboration with the US COVID-19 Forecast Hub, which is led by Nicholas Reich's lab at the University of Massachusetts. And whereas the German-Polish Hub assembles 18 models, the US Hub is an aggregate of about 75 models. The key purpose of this type of uncertainty quantification and probabilistic forecasting is to allow for the best possible decision-making, but even ensemble forecasts are far from perfect. Gnighting told me that the experience has been quite sobering because this research demonstrates that even with state-of-the-art models, there is substantial uncertainty. The pandemic is simply uncharted territory. But nevertheless, he sees value in these investigations, even if only in simply making clear that any kind of predictions and hence policy decisions regarding the pandemic are incredibly difficult. So that's been my current focus. Um, a couple of weeks ago, there was a, a long awaited paper posted by this international collaboration. Um, this is the paper's author list with 70 different um, authors and affiliations, which I think slowed down the editing process quite a bit. I had to get many approvals. Um, and for me, I think it, it might prove a jumping off point for an article sort of digging into um, you know, the uncertainty in modeling further, um, the advantage of ensemble forecasts and just sort of trying to further enlighten our, our chronic state of uncertainty. As Nick Reich, who leads the US Hub, put it uh, recently in an op-ed in the Washington Post, he said, the pandemic is shaped by human behavior. So educating people about the benefits and limitations of forecasts can help us in a sense fight the pandemic. My latest published article on COVID-19 covered a vaccine prioritization study. The study used what's called a coupled model modeling both human behavior and disease dynamics. It was somewhat atypical for an infectious disease study because it applied game theory, a mathematical way of modeling how people make strategic decisions within a group, combining that with more traditional epidemiological modeling. The real novelty here was factoring in human behavior into the modeling with the goal of greater accuracy in the projections. This was by another husband and wife team, Chris Bodge at the University of Waterloo and Madur Anand at the University of Guelph in Canada and their PhD student, Peter Jentz. And the prisoner's dilemma is a scenario of course in which players weigh cooperation against betrayal, uh, often producing a less than optimal outcome for the common good. Um, and when the story was published, a reader wrote in and, and pointed out that another game theory framework would also be relevant it's called an assurance game or trust dilemma, which describes a conflict between safety and social cooperation. Um, but as Botch described it, the pandemic presents an everyday complexity of such choices. Imagine if every, everyone followed public health recommendations, they wore masks, socially distanced, washed their hands, followed stay at home orders. He said, in that case, of course, there is a significantly reduced risk of infection, but there are always trade-offs and temptations to defect from the regimen. Masks are annoying, hand washing is tedious, sometimes we need a hug. In his lectures, when talking about the use of game theory in human environment systems modeling, Botch likes to invoke the comparison between the writer Anne Rand, who made a virtue of selfishness, and Star Trek Spock, who said, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. The researchers argued that using game theory to model human behavior injects an extra dose of realism to epidemiological modeling. They drew, um, on they, they drew on Google data that revealed who went where when in Ontario from March to November. And this data was used as a proxy in the game theory model, approximating how stringently people adhere to social distancing and other public health advice over time. It captures how people respond to the ups and downs of daily existence and how our actions in turn make all the difference. As I heard one epidemiologist put it, an army of umbrellas won't change the weather, but vaccination can be a powerful force in defeating the coronavirus. Now the final piece I'll highlight is one that I published back in August, which ran under the headline, how to think like an epidemiologist. Uh, but the working title had been how to think like a Bayesian which more accurately captures what the piece was getting at, I think. It looked at how Bayesian analysis can be used in an epidemiological setting to hone the accuracy of predictions and projections. 
This piece, although published in August, originated way back in last March when I spoke to Bill Hanage about that uh, breaking the chain of transmission infographic. He'd made a kind of offhand remark about given all the new information coming in daily, he was in a constant state of reminding himself to update your priors. And that was just a phrase that caught my attention. And then I saw it mentioned on Twitter here and there and I got Googling and that sent me down the, the Bayesian rabbit hole. So as I, I stated here at the outset of the piece, update your priors refers to the iterative process of updating evidence and the gradual accumulation of knowledge. This is in a sense, the heart of Bayesian analysis named after Thomas Bayes, an 18th century Presbyterian minister who did math on the side. And Bayes theorem is a device for rationally updating your prior beliefs and uncertainties based on observed evidence. Now I'd say I was aware of Bayes generally speaking, but I definitely needed a Bayesian boot camp of sorts to, to get myself uh, up to speed on the finer details, which I'm still not sure I have the best grasp, grasp of, but I definitely have the gist of it. Um, and for this, the statistician Joe Blitzstein at Harvard proved an invaluable source. Blitzstein delves into the utility of Bayesian analysis in his popular course, Statistics 110, which he's given 15 years running uh, with one sabbatical year in there. And the entire course is available on YouTube. In lecture one for a primer, he says, math is the logic of certainty and statistics is the logic of uncertainty. Everyone has uncertainty. If you have 100% certainty about everything, there's something wrong with you. By the end of lecture four, he arrives at Bayes' theorem, which he says is his favorite theorem because it is mathematically simple yet con conceptually powerful. In Blitzstein's hands, it can be proved in one line. And he likes to say the theorem essentially reduces to a fraction. And it expresses the probability P of some event A happening given the occurrence of another event B. He said to quote, naively, you would think, how much can you get from that? It turns out to have deep consequences and to be applicable to just about every field of inquiry from genetics to political science to historical studies and beyond. As I found digging around, the Bayesian approach is used in analyzing racial disparities in policing and in search and rescue operations. The search area narrows as no new data is added. Cognitive scientists ask, is the brain Bayesian? And philosophers of science posit that science as a whole is a Bayesian process, as is common sense. Bayes theorem is also frequently used to assess the accuracy of diagnostic tests factoring in the sensitivity and specificity of the tests. And this is a subject that was discussed quite a bit at the beginning of the pandemic. How accurate were the COVID tests? How likely were false positives and false negatives? And what were the implications? And if you're interested in doing a deep dive in this, I'd recommend Blitzstein's animated explainer titled Bayesville on YouTube, which is both charming and informative. So the scientific core of my Bayesian article was a study exploring a somewhat novel use of Bayesian analysis in epidemiological modeling by two researchers at Stanford, Susan Holmes and her then PhD student, Claire Donnett. Donnett has since received her PhD and she's now at Chicago. Their motivation came by observing research in March about how the pandemic might evolve. They noticed that classic epidemiological models tended to use fixed parameters or constants for the reproduction number say a reproduction number of two, the reproduction number being the average number of secondary cases generated per infectious case. But in real reality, of course, the reproduction number is not a constant. It depends on random uncertain factors, viral loads and susceptibility, behavior and social networks, culture, socioeconomic class, weather, air conditioning, and many other unknowns. With a Bayesian perspective, they explained, the uncertainty is encoded into randomness. Donna and Holmes began by supposing that the reproductive number had various distributions, the priors. Then they modeled the uncertainty using a random variable that fluctuates, taking on a range of values as small as 0.6 and as large as 3.5. In something of a nesting process, the random variable itself has parameters that fluctuate randomly. And those parameters too have random parameters or hyperparameters and so on. The effects accumulate into a Bayesian hierarchy. Holmes calls it turtles all the way down. And she explained that the up and down random fluctuations multiply like compound interest. As a result, the study found that using random variables for reproductive numbers 
more realistically predicts the risky tail events, the rarer but more significant super spreaders. I spoke to a number of researchers about this somewhat atypical approach to uh, COVID-19 research and modeling to get a survey of opinions, and they agreed it was valuable. Natalie Dean, a biostatistician at the University of Florida, said, we should be less focused on finding the single truth and more focused on establishing a reasonable range, recognizing that the true value may vary across populations. Bayesian analysis allows us to include this variability in a clear way and then propagate this uncertainty through the model. Humans on their own, however, without a Bayesian model for a compass, are notoriously bad at fathoming individual risk, but it is a perspective that one can cultivate. For Mark Lipsitch, an infectious disease epidemiologist at Harvard, Bayesian reasoning comes awfully close to what he calls his working definition of rationality. He said, as we learn more, our beliefs should change. One extreme is to decide what you think and be impervious to new information. Another extreme is to overprivilege the last thing you learned. In rough terms, Bayesian reasoning is a principled way to integrate what you previously thought with what you have learned and come to a conclusion that incorporates them both, giving them appropriate weights. But even with evidence, revising beliefs isn't easy, not even for scientists and experts. We've seen this with the World Health Organization, with its advice about masks, for instance. When we don't update, problems arise. Returning to Spiegelhalter, who's always good value, he said, you can interpret confirmation bias and so many ways in which we react poorly by being too slow to revise our beliefs. But he also noted optimistically that various techniques compensate for Bayesian shortcomings. He's particularly fond of a general approach called Cromwell's law. And I'll give Spiegelhalter the last word and end with a paraphrasing of his retelling of Cromwell's law. It goes like this. In 1650, Oliver Cromwell, Lord Protector of the Commonwealth of England, wrote in a letter to the Church of Scotland, I beseech you in the bowels of Christ, think it possible you may be mistaken. In the Bayesian world, Spiegelhalter said, Cromwell's law means you should always keep a bit back with a little bit of probability, a tiny little bit, for the fact that you may be wrong. Then if new evidence comes along that totally contradicts your main prior belief, you can quickly ditch what you thought before and lurch over to that new way of thinking. In other words, Spiegelhalter said, keep an open mind. That's a very powerful idea. And it doesn't have to be done technically or formally. It can just be in the back of your mind as an idea. Call it modeling humility, he said. You may be wrong. And with that, I will end and open it up to questions, if there are any. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Siobhan. Uh, so uh, people can use the Q&A feature uh, or, or we'll just speak up if they're um, in here as a, as a panelist. Um, um, let, let me start, Siobhan, the, um, uh, the Spiegelhalter study that you presented at the start about the impact on trust of uh, communicating uncertainty showed mm -hmm. that it helps to, to be quantitative. I guess, um, you know, I'm curious about that. It, it seems like there, as you pointed out, there are lots of different kinds of uncertainty. You know, if you have, if you have well-modeled randomness, then it's very easy to quantify that. And that's the sort of thing that I imagine would, would definitely increase trust if you realized, you know, what the error bars are for, for something that's well-modeled. But mm -hmm. this other sort of, um, you know, uh, un, unmodeled, uh, un uncertainty about our models, um, you yes. know, and maybe that's the experts that are disagreeing or even worse, un you know, uncertainty, our models, there are diagnostics that demonstrate our models aren't, aren't right, but we don't have the right ones. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it feels like these are different kinds of uncertainty that and communicating them could have a very different impact about uh, mm -hmm. perceptions of, of, of... Yeah, I mean, I, th I think in my discussions with um, Rainey Dastin, the overall... Um, conclusion that that she has you know come to and is is kind of concerned about is that the public has a um you know a slightly skewed idea of what science broadly speaking is all about and just this notion that things should be certain and it's it's a binary true and false and um you know so yeah there's there's definitely spectrum of uncertainty and some results are more reliable than others and and so it's 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 kind of this russian doll nesting effect of 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 right. uncertainty and, and where do you end and so we're kind of swimming in it 
Um, but I guess that's the, the broader point is that we need to be more comfortable with, with uncertainty and, you know, and, and, and also that goes along with sort of encouraging critical thinking and, you know, to just constantly be in kind of a mode of, of gauging what the uncertainty is and how reliable, um, Spiegelhalter actually, I followed up with him and, and asked him what the latest was and they published another, um, uh, paper just about five rules for evidence communication and 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 talking about you know um, not only disclosing uncertainties but the idea of informing not persuading offering balance not false balance um, so there's various tools that you know assuming good goodwill on the part of the scientists um, and that they're they're doing you know results that that have integrity that you know I think are, are ways that would help the public come to grips with uncertainty. So I guess I was asking about the original study and, and what was the nature of the uncertainty there? You know, was it was it low in the, the hierarchical Bayesian model or was it, you know, uncertainties about the experts disagreeing in what what's the right way to model a phenomenon? Um, in, in terms of the types of uncertainty they were they were studying? Yeah, and that and that, you know, this result about um, not having much of an impact on trust, you know, mm -hmm. was that what, what was the nature of the uncertainty in that, in that study? Um, well, they were looking at, um, I mean, if I remember correctly, it wasn't, it wasn't too technical. I mean, they were just testing statements about things like tigers in England and, you know, the unemployment rate. And, and so giving people statements that, that either included a numerical quantitative descriptor versus a word, a word like approximately, and then they just, you know, surveyed people, you know, which statement do you think is more accurate, which person seems more reliable. Um, so yeah, it wasn't, you know, getting into the, the details of, of Bayesian hierarchy is a, is a totally other ball of wax, for right. sure. And I don't, I don't think they were probing those levels of... <laughs> yeah, but it sounds like... It's literacy, like yeah. What you called aleatory um, uncertainty. Yes, right, right. All right, great. Any other questions? Sure. Uh, I know in terms of COVID modeling, there have been a variety of models over time. Initially, there were epidemiological models like the Oxford model that were predicting uh, very quickly, uh, you know, millions of deaths. Uh, uh, there was the Institute for Health Metrics model, which was a model that you that used past curves and couldn't possibly produce metrics of uncertainty, which were actually at least initially convinced the Trump administration to do something, though they had problems and how they were going down. So then hugely criticized. And then in the fall, while all the other models, epidemiological models were suggesting that it would, things would stay down. If you looked at there's models of the sort that you saw, all the others were predicting that things would be going down if you look even early in October and even things like uh, uh, Goo's model at that point. Um, they were predicting a, a very substantial increase in the fall with their curve fitting models where you couldn't express uncertainty. And so I'm just interested in, you know, these uncertainties are with the public and also with, you know, decision makers in positions of a, uh, authority who have a unit change it. And just what you've seen sort of in the balance of that. I mean, I don't have any particular uh, Thing to you know direction to push you in asking the question but just generally what's your reaction to that and uncertainty um yeah i mean i guess it's along the same lines that it's it's um definitely confusing and it, it makes it sort of seem like it's a futile effort to really hone in on any specifics but i think you know cumulatively and iteratively i think just to i think to continue to take it in and to be um you know try and synthesize in a critical way. I mean, I think that's the only strategy. I don't know what, what else we can, what else we can do in this situation. I mean, it's in the ensemble um, team. I mean, that's kind of an interesting approach and in that they, it, you know, by averaging, maybe it, it kind of, you know, shades out some of the, the spikes. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of looking at, at that right now in Goo's work, but yeah, I'm not, I'm keen to think, hear what anybody else might think about that. I think it's, you know, it, it is what it is. And we, we just have to sort of adjust our lens, broadly speaking, is the only way to, to deal with it, I think. 
So do you think there's any difference in, in sort of how, how this communication should go for the general public or do you see there versus, you know, makers or do you, uh, is, I don't, I don't know whether any, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think decision, decision makers and policy makers should be able to, um, you know, look at a, a greater, more granular, set of facts and results and and perhaps try to you know make more refined decisions based on that but as Knighting said you know um it's it's kind of an impossible task for them as well i mean you sort of you you make your best bet and cross your fingers and you hope that you're within the realms of of, of reality um i guess it's, it's you know it's a very there's no baseline so just have to do the best we can, I guess. Sorry, that's not very satisfying, but. It's fine. Uh, so I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on where the biggest sources of uh, public misunderstanding of science come from. Uh, do you think it's something scientists are doing wrong? Is it journalists? Is it the education system? Is it politicians? Yeah, I mean, I think it has to go back to, to some degree, education. Um, you know, especially with mathematics, there's the kind of knee-jerk phobia of, of math. Um, and, you know, there are many, in terms of the, the media, there's many outlets that are doing um, quite a good job in terms of trying to present the complexities and distill them down. Um, but it's hard to control the quality of, of, of coverage when you have so many, so many different outlets and it's on social media and people essentially just, you know, have time to read the, the headlines, you know, they're not necessarily um, taking in the entire article. And even in, I've found that even in um, some of the outlets that are, that are doing the deep reporting and, and really taking time to, uh, explain and try and unpack things that that still the headline will will be a bit sensationalist and and won't necessarily get at the content the substance of the article and and sometimes you see that the you know there's there's mild outrage at the headlines and and you go back the next day and the headline has changed and and so i think that's you know with with covid i think that's something that editors are are um gradually realizing is that you know you, you have to be slightly more pragmatic and and straightforward in, in crafting the headlines when, when you're writing about COVID-19 and the pandemic. Um, but it's, it's, it's been interesting to see, you know, there's been debates about um, science journalists who are essentially covering pre preprints. So b b before an article even makes it to the, the preprint server, um, a, a, a journalist will get access to it and, you know, do rigorous reporting and, and consult with 20 different um, scientists and get their views on it and, and, and publish it. And, and that gets criticism and pushback. Um, but they're kind of ahead of the, ahead of the curve and, and science or journalism, as they described it, you know, it has its own motivations and its own um, mechanisms and, and processes. And it's, it's, it's not to necessarily wait for scientific papers to be um, reviewed and, and published formally, especially in the middle of a pandemic. So, I mean, I think everybody's grappling with a, a changing state of play and, and, and trying to, you know, do their job with integrity and, um, you know, trying to get the best information as possible out there. Um, but, I, you know, I think in terms of, I've kind of meandered off from your question, but, um, I think just the more we can get the public engaged in 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 science and and how it obviously infiltrates our our life day to day, um, and in, a, in an odd way, I think the the pandemic has forced that, and, and maybe it's something that will um, then carry over into uh, cl climate change coverage and and other areas, and I think that would be a, a positive for sure. So one of the um... One of the things I have in mind is um, the way schools teach science is 
um, okay, you go and do an experiment and you should get the right answer. And if you don't get the right answer, then you, you don't get the grades. Mm. And it, it doesn't seem to be late on, say, in, until late on in a university degree where you're suddenly taught to uh, think about the uncertainties, think about the sources of errors. Um, do you think there's a way to better communicate thinking about uncertainty to, uh, for example, uh, primary or secondary school education? Yeah, I mean, it just takes it, you know, it, it really comes down to the the teachers and whether they have the the attention, um, you know, the intention, the attention in terms of energy, the support and the resources um, to, I guess, adjust the curriculum in, in those subtle ways that, you know, take the time and explore those subjects. Similarly with, with mathematics, you know, you, you do the drills and, um, you know, I loved the drills in math and as soon as it got uh hard it was you know it quickly became my worst subject and although I continued along with it you know the idea was you know the feeling was well I'm horrible at it this is you know this is bad but in in fact that's when math starts to get interesting you know you're when you're when you're feeling uncomfortable that's essentially what mathematics is all about um and so to make things like that clear to students definitely at a at, at an early age should should um shift their perspective of, of what science and math are all about um, Peter Sarnak said when I was writing the, the Conway book, um, you know, his, his steady state is, is one of frustration. Um, and you really have to just be comfortable being frustrated. And, um, and that's, that's the mathematical research process, which I found fascinating. Um, it's definitely something I identified with from my limited experience with mathematics. Thank you. Um, and Maria had a question. Um, yes, thank you. Don't you think that uh, uh, perhaps the communication could be improved by being more uh, multidisciplinary? For example, I noticed that um, during this pandemic, the experts um, who have been um, mostly asked to come forward with uh, information have been uh, almost invariably medical doctors or uh, at most mathematicians and statisticians. Um, whereas I think uh, that uh, also historians, uh, computer scientists, uh, um, uh, scientists um, doing ecology um, should be involved because uh, all these facets uh, contribute to understand the picture. The picture. For example, um, if you ask uh, a historian, they could point out that uh, epidemics uh, always existed in human history. And so maybe this is less new than uh, people might think up front. Um, if you, uh, if uh, scientists, who studied the environment were asked, they could point out that um, most likely um, this um, illness is a zoonosis, and it is um, um, a virus that mutated from um, um, a non-human species to the human species. And this has happened before. It happened with um, HIV, it happened with the first SARS. And uh, I mean, if, and for example, people connect the happening of these uh, mutations and their apparent um, higher frequency, if it is true, I, I'm not an expert in that area, in the latest years with the degradation of the environment. So I think that a, a more multidisciplinary approach could help, uh, um, could help the public uh, um, tolerate and understand this uh, situation of not knowing many things. Thank you. Yeah, I thoroughly agree. And I think, I think we have seen that to some extent and, and, and to some extent that's what I've tried to do in my coverage. I haven't so much covered results of studies but I've been, I've been covering um, novel approaches. So um, I mean, statisticians are, are well within the, the realm of modeling and, um, but you know, the, the 
the study done by uh, Chris Botch and Madura and Ann, you know, they're, she's an ecologist and a poet. He's a, a, a mathematical biologist, um, but, you know, so they're, they're bringing a different um, perspective um, and, 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 you know, and bringing uh, Rainey Daston in with the historical perspective, um, there was definitely more of her insight that I, I could have included in the piece, but, you know, there wasn't, there wasn't room, but, and I think you do see people in, in a variety of disciplines um, contributing. Sometimes it's more with um, op-ed pieces, um, but I think, I think it has been reasonably kind of well-rounded in, in that um, respect, you know, maybe in, in the latter months, you know, the latter half of last year, when people started to kind of pull back and, and look for the, the broader perspectives that could be more informative. But I think it's a very good point, definitely. All right, thanks very much. Um, so, so join me in thanking Siobhan for a, a really great talk. It was really fascinating. You've given us a lot to think about. Thank, Thank you. you. Glad you enjoyed it. My pleasure. <laughs>